All right, so as I was saying, our case numbers here uh, in the triad are running about 4.2 per 100,000, and in Mecklenburg, uh, just a tad higher than that. A little bit higher in Wake County, up around 12 per 100,000. We have a new metric that we follow now, um, and here in North Carolina, we were a pilot for this, um, and, um, and so we are, uh, are well ahead of other states in being able to do it. And that's looking at our wastewater. Um, and in other words, uh, going down to the sewer and you grab some samples of sewage and then you do molecular analysis for little pieces of coronavirus um, in that sewage. Um, and you can tell how much COVID is in a community. And we validated that here in, in North Carolina. And it seems to follow along case numbers. And now that we're having um, uh, a lot of home testing going on, um, and we don't capture all the cases. Um, wastewater treatments become an important thing, and it actually starts to go up earlier than um, case numbers do. So, uh, looking at our wastewater um, numbers um, uh, yesterday uh, here in um, North Carolina, all of our cities in North Carolina, except for the Raleigh Durham area. Uh, the number of particles of COVID are still going down. Raleigh, Durham, they've actually went up a little bit last week. So it might show that we might have a little bit of a, of a wavelet coming, uh, which brings me to BA2. I, I get a lot of questions about the so-called uh, stealth variant of Omicron or the son of Omicron, the subvariant of Omicron, and what it'll mean. Um, and all along, I've been saying, you know, I'm not sure it's as big of a deal uh, as, as some of our previous variants were. Delta was a big deal. Omicron was a big deal. This, the BA2 variant, maybe not. We might have a, a, a slight increase in cases because it is a little bit more infectious. But it doesn't evade immunity any differently than Omicron does. And it, it is certainly isn't any more severe than Omicron. So I, I personally am not being kept awake at night by it. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if our cases don't go up a little bit, um, particularly as we get into the hotter months in summer when more people stay inside. But, um, but I don't see a large surge, to use that term. Um, maybe we'll call it, I'm anticipating a wavelet, which we should be able to get through pretty well. Um, we have to keep an eye out um, for other variants on the horizon. And right now, I don't see too many out there yet uh, that are of a concern. But it could happen. Um, and so we have to stay vigilant for that. Um, the, the big thing, um, I think, in the news this week was the FDA um, uh, approving uh, a fourth booster. And I'm getting, I'm losing track of the <laughs> boosters and the number of shots. So if I'm losing track, I'm sure you are. So let's see what we can do um, to clarify what this means. So um, the, why, why did this data go to the FDA? Well, first of all, uh, Moderna and Pfizer um, had some information that um, immunity wanes somewhat as measured by antibodies in the blood um, as time goes on. And, um, and so they tried um, looking at a fourth dose, and it brings up those antibodies to roughly the same level as the third dose did, so the booster number one. And then there's been some data out of Israel that suggests, particularly in people over the age of 75, um, that um, a fourth booster reduces somewhat hospitalizations and death compared to having just three shots. So for, for if you're over 75, it seems like that four might be better than three, but s small. Our, our information here in the United States says that I actually haven't had three shots, which is the first series plus one booster, uh, is really hanging in there for protecting people uh, during Omicron and with the Omicron and with BA2 also from uh, hospitalization and, and complications and death. And so people who've had three shots, if they get COVID, largely get a COVID cold. Four shots protects a little bit more 
for symptomatic COVID, you know, in other words, a COVID cold, those three to four days is a stuffy nose and such, um, then three shots. But all of this, as you get younger, it doesn't make as much difference. Mm -hmm. A fourth dose doesn't seem to make as much. Three, four, it's pretty much the same. So why did we choose 50 as the age cutoff here in the United States? But I told you 75 and over is the big one, maybe 65 in, in one study. But we took 50 because there's a large number of people in historically marginalized populations, uh, ethnically and racially marginalized, between the ages of 50 and 65, who have a lot of underlying health conditions. Um, so uh, being overweight, <clears throat> diabetes, uh, heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease, so on and so forth. Strokes are more common in, in the population. So we wanted to make sure that they had full access to vaccine to our public health venues. So the FDA said, well, we'll go ahead and offer it to them. And then that way, if they want it, they can get it. So the FDA said, okay, it's, there's some efficacy, particularly in over 75. And then there's, um, and it's safe. There really was no safety signal at all that was worrisome. So now the CDC has to weigh in. What the CDC is going to say is, if you want a booster, it's available to you if you're over 50. Not exactly the strongest language for saying, you know, run, don't walk down to your local vaccine center to get a booster. Um, so what does Dr. Ohl think you should do? So here's what I think you should do. If you're over 75 or you have a lot of underlying health problems, which means you see a doctor a lot for chronic disease, you know, I'd probably go out and get a booster now. Um, and, um, and I think that's okay. Um, if you're under the age of 50 and you're otherwise pretty healthy, I really don't think you need it right now. And I'd go ahead and wait. Um, and I, I, what would I wait for? I would wait for, um, another big surge on the horizon or for this fall. And, um, and so immunocompromised people, most of them have already gotten four doses. So we're now saying for immunocompromised, you might want to go get a fifth. So um, because um, people who are severely immunocompromised don't respond to vaccines as well. Any vaccine, not just COVID. So, um, so those are some special groups. And then lastly, I think that if you've gotten um, one J and J shot and, and or two J and J shots, I'd run out and get a messenger RNA booster. And I'd, I'd probably go do that right now because the immunity from J and J doesn't last as long. So I, I think, um, so that's my recommendations for now. So if you're over 75, if you're over 50 and have a lot of health problems, I'd go get it now. Um, and if you're immunocompromised, time to go get dose number five. And if you're a JAJ person, I'd get in a messenger RNA chaser because it, it really does seem to give you better protection. That's great advice. Yep. So that's, uh, that's the booster scenario. But while we're talking about boosters, what's the important question here? Um, we, we need a long-term strategy for how to vaccinate for COVID. Um, we, we need to have something that's in place that um, people can count on that's based on science and, and that where we can um, protect ourselves as a population moving forward. We can't keep boosting ourselves out of a pandemic. And you know this, wow, well, we're gonna boost now, what about later and all this, that's, we need a long-term strategy. And where I think that long-term strategy is headed is uh, at least for a few years, while COVID still has considerable health impacts, particularly on vulnerable people. I think we're gonna be going to a yearly shot. And I would be anticipating next fall before our respiratory virus season that the CDC recommendations are gonna be more than, eh, if you want one, go get it. They're gonna be more, yeah, it's time to go get it for a couple of reasons. One, 
fall, late fall and winter are a big are a big time for for respiratory viruses, all of them, not just COVID. Um, and then I think also there there may be, um, and I, I would like to see, a more specific COVID vaccine, that's a second generation vaccine that's a little bit more uh, protective than our first generation vaccines, have a little <laughs> bit longer lasting immunity than our first generation, and have a little bit more targeting of the current variants that are that are circulating, which right now is is Omicron and it's and it's buddy, uh, uh, BA2. And so if you're under 50 and you don't need a booster now, stand by for the fall. And I think that will be boosting uh, the population at large again then, and particularly uh, students and people in congregate settings where it'll be important. Um, speaking of congregate settings, by the way, it's been a great semester for our universities very, very low numbers, less than a handful over the last six weeks even. So, um, so things are going well with them and with our public schools as well. I think we'll get through graduation this year with, uh, with minimal problems or hiccups. That doesn't mean that we're not still having some cases of COVID. Uh, we are. Um, and um, most of you who are viewing right now probably know somebody who's got in yeah. the last three weeks. A lot of that's because we're not taking the precautions we were. We're not masking for the most part, and we're not, uh, we're doing things like going on vacation in large crowded places like I did last week. Um, so um, so it, it, well, there's more chances of exposure. Um, the, um, w I think that, um, you know, we're slowly sliding into an endemic period. I'm asking, I'm asking, being asked all the time, are we fully at endemicity now? No, we're just not in a, so much of an emergency phase of the pandemic anymore. Um, Europe, which everyone says, oh, but the cases are rising in Europe. Actually, if you look this week, the cases are coming down in Europe again. They had a little post Omicron shoulder or wavelet afterwards that some say was BA2, but mostly it was probably because they stopped their restrictions there. Um, and uh, But they're coming down again too, and as is Asia. So um, I think that, um, you know, we'll still see COVID. It's still going to be around. It's still happening. Are we going to have to be going back to full masking um, when we go out and places like that? Or, social distancing or cutting back on activities. I, I hope not. I, unless we have a really major variant change, I don't see that in our future. All right, let's talk about the heart, an important organ. Very important organ. Yeah, probably for you, the most important <laughs> organ. Um, I'm a little biased in that. Topic. Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. We've learned a lot about COVID uh, and the heart um, in the last two and a half years. A lot more to learn yet. COVID's kind of a sneaky, mysterious virus, and um, it, it affects organs that are far away from the, the lungs and the respiratory tract. We talked last week about the brain. So um, <clears throat> let's start off, because there was, a, a, I think, an important article in, uh, in Nature um, last month that uh, looked at a large number of people um, who've had COVID and then looked in, at their uh, uh, rates of having heart disease afterwards and found out it was up higher than what would be expected for people who didn't have COVID. You want to talk about what those findings were a little bit? Yeah, um, it's kind of similar to what you said is COVID tends to do more. We might be presenting with, you know, respiratory illness. You might be a cough, shortness of breath. We had seen some of that loss of taste, um, but it is doing, you know, creating and unmasking a lot of inflammation throughout the body. And so what we've been able to say is that effect, C is some of that effect, especially in the heart, um, can predispose people who would otherwise have had heart disease later, earlier, or some people who potentially just are at more sensitive to some of this inflammation to unmask heart disease. Yeah. So we have seen people with accelerated coronary artery disease, um, accelerated or long-term inflammation around the heart, um, and some people with just kind of this recurrent non-specific chest pain or, or heart-type pain that even though isn't necessarily a active heart attack is still being detrimental to them and to their right. heart long term. So coronary artery disease is a word we use for 
hardening of the arteries in the heart, yeah. which makes it harder for the blood to get through to the muscle of the heart. When the muscle of the heart gets starved for blood and oxygen, then it, it gives you pain. And if it happens long enough, you get a heart attack. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you're saying that maybe heart attacks are a little bit more common if you've had COVID before in some people. In some people. Um, it's, it's, it's often people who have predisposing risk factors. If you have diabetes, you're overweight, kidney disease, um, your, your heart disease that you might be predisposed to later in life, we're seeing it just a little bit sooner because of, of yeah. what COVID has kind of done to your system. So it kind of unmasks something that exactly. might happen anyway. Exactly. Yeah, and don't forget about smoking, by the way. Yes, the risk and there. Yeah. yeah, one that people can change. Um, Absolutely. Is that is that specific to COVID, or do we see that with other viruses? No, also? it's it's not specific uh. to COVID. Um, a lot we see a lot of it, especially in flu. Flu is similar in that it can it can basically wreak havoc to a lot of your systems, not just um, the lungs in itself. Um, so it's not very much specific to COVID. Um, as time will go on, we can probably will learn a little bit more specifically what about COVID or what strains or what 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 risk factors you may have and how COVID can predispose yeah. you to heart disease. But um, a lot of times, it's any virus that can do damage to your body as a whole um, will. Uh, include and stress your heart as well and so if your your heart is not otherwise healthy you can say hey this is this was kind of what opened the door to saying now now it's time for my heart disease to come out or or yeah. show it a little bit earlier yeah yeah i mean i i've through the ages of uh, i mean we've been on and with studies where we've looked at flu yeah. and other respiratory viruses as well and there always seems to be a bit of a signal it's when you get inflammation throughout your body, the heart's just one place. It kind of adds on a little bit of plaque or hardening in the artery. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so that's uh, so that's coronary artery disease or predisposition to um, to chest pain and, and heart attack. Also, I've heard some about um, something we call atrial fibrillation, which is a fluttering of the top part of the heart. Is there an association there? Yeah, so generally for most people, you know, there's, there's one quarterback in the heart who, who controls how your heart is beating and making sure the top half and bottom half are together. Um, atrial fibrillation is when, you know, there's a lot of little guys that are basically competing <coughs> with each other and rather than having one good squeeze, it's more of kind of a shudder. Um, and we have both during active infections as well as people who have recovered from infections seen a little bit of rise in atrial fibrillation. Um, I would, some of that from what we understand is, is still similar to what we talked about further is this is someone who likely had a pathway to go and have atrial fibrillation at some point in their life, um, but this infection basically triggered and unmasked it so that it was either during the infection or mm -hmm. now it's unmasked earlier or sooner and they're, they're being affected by it. Yeah. Um, so people who've had either of these unmasked, so let's say you have coronary artery disease and you um, what what kind of things should people be looking for? What are the, the initial signs and symptoms? Well, coronary artery disease first. Yeah, um, if you have any concern that you're having heart pain, that would be chest pain, pain in your chest, pain that goes up to your neck, down your arm, um, from atrial fibrillation. If you feel like your heart's beating really, really fast and or you feel like you're about to pass out or actually do pass out are concerning symptoms. Um, some of the less common symptoms um, would be, you know, if you can do a lot of activity normally but are slowly every day realizing, I can't do as much as I used to do before, or, you know, walking up that flight of stairs really took a lot out of me. Um, a lot of times that can be subtle signs and symptoms that should be concerning that potentially it is your heart. Yeah. And, and if that should happen, is this something that you can just wait for your next appointment next year to talk about with your doctor? or? What should you do? I mean, we, we would definitely advocate not. Um, if, you're, if you're having chest pain and it's active, it's going down your arm, or you're concerned about your heart um, to a point that you can't see someone in urgent care or primary care, or you think it's something more active that needs to come to the hospital, come to the hospital. Let us see you. Let us evaluate you here. Um, if it's something that you can call your primary care doctor or go to an urgent care doctor and get an appointment relatively quickly, um, that's also a good place yeah, to start. Yeah, certainly, and if it doesn't go away. Absolutely. If it doesn't go away, you need, to, you need to get to the ED. So this is one of those times I'm saying go to the ED. 
Most of the time I say don't go to the ED, but this yeah. is one of those times. It's tough because a lot of the <coughs> symptoms we're saying can be a lot of different things. Yeah, but right. the last thing you want to do is miss that it's your heart. So. Yeah, let's not mess with the heart. Exactly, so. exactly. So what, you know, there's been a lot of talk also about myocarditis, and we'll talk about with vaccine in a minute, but, um, but myocarditis in the heart, because I, I remember the first time we heard about this was actually in athletes. Yeah going back uh, early in the pandemic where um, some athletes had gotten it and then they got an MRI of the heart, which is really complex imaging, and it showed inflammation in the heart. Um, what more do we know? I mean, the myocarditis and, and COVID, what the, the, yeah. the infection itself. Um, so the heart is obviously the heart. It has its muscle and there's the sac around the heart as well. Um, if either of these um, have inflammation, um, that's generally what we call, if it's the muscle myocarditis or the sac um, pericarditis. Um, a lot of times, a lot of what we've also learned from this and studied from this was that a lot of viruses can generate and cause uh, myocarditis. Um, it wasn't necessarily COVID specific, but if you actually looked up myocarditis and causes, that list is very, very, very long. But what we've been able to notice, especially during this, pa this the pandemic and with this, the numbers that we've had is there is an association um, with both people who have ha the virus or actively um, have, a, have a virus and symptoms from it um, tend, can have more myocarditis as compared to someone who's not. Um, but that even though there is that association, the actual overall numbers, it is still quite rare. Yeah, yeah, it is. I and mean, I've seen myocarditis from flu, particularly in kids, yeah. um, where sometimes it pops up, but uh, and a lot of other viruses as well. But let's say you're an athlete, um, and um, let's say that you're um, playing for a large North Carolina university in the NCAA, <laughs> con and you got COVID last week. Should you be worried that you might have this myocarditis? What what should you do? It's, it's still overall very rare. Um, the odds are, are quite quite low that um, someone who's recovered from COVID or have active COVID to have myocarditis. So first of all, knowing that it, the risk is quite low should be very reassuring to yourself. Um, if there is concerns, whether that's you as an individual or based off of symptoms you might be having, um, you do need to be checked out. We have, like uh, Dr. had referenced, imaging or an MRI that can look for this inflammation. We have blood work that can kind of signal that, that there's that inflammation. And then we can kind of assess to see is, is this inflammation potentially um, have some kind of serious effect for you. Um, again, while rare, if there is concern that this myocarditis, you do have myocarditis and it is affecting your heart, then at that point we would say, you know, you likely would not want to be participating in the tournament right. as is. Yeah, until you're over it. But least. more often than not, um, it's a very self-resolving illness. A lot of times these people aren't even needing to present to the hospital um, and for the most part can continue their yeah. activity as they're they And are. the symptoms are pain again and fatigue and Exactly. And it's of it's some of those, yeah. you know, symptoms that can mask fevers, chills, chest pain, shortness of breath, and then fatigue is a large one. Uh, are these treatable? The heart disease and the atrial fib and the myocarditis? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it it doesn't we don't have any kind of COVID specific, it's not COVID coronary disease or COVID myocarditis um, and we don't necessarily go down and develop new treatments in that realm but we have very good treatments for coronary artery disease for atrial fibrillation and for supporting you through myocarditis um, just as you would if you had these any uh, of those diseases that's good news. outside of, yeah. of COVID. Yeah that's that's great news actually yeah, yeah. so um, a little bit about um, vaccination and myocarditis um, and I, I'll start out by there's a lot of misinformation on this so there is an association with, uh, with myocarditis and, and um, the messenger RNA vaccines, both Pfizer's and Moderna's. Um, and the, um, the, it's a very, very rare entity. Um, and the numbers are roughly between 50 to 60 per million, million. people uh, between the ages of 18 and 30. Um, so if you like those odds, I'd, you need to run out and buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then uh, as you get younger, it goes down. And as you get older, it goes down. So we now have data in the 5 to 12-year-old group, um, and, and it's 4 per million people. Um, and it turns out that with booster doses, it's even lower. It's below 1 per million. 
Um, so it's, it's mostly the second dose of the primary series. Boosters are a lot less likely. And it turns out now that we're giving those first two doses eight weeks apart rather than three or four weeks apart, the incidence goes down even more. The Canadians figured that out. So it's a rare entity, but it does happen. So if I asked you, compare the risk of getting myocarditis actually from getting COVID compared to getting a messenger RNA vaccine, which one's higher? Oh, the, the myocarditis from the active infection would be higher. Yeah. Yeah. And we call that a risk-benefit ratio in medicine. Exactly. Where we measure your risk from the disease, and then we measure the risk from the vaccine. And if your risk from the vaccine, disease is up here, and your risk from the vaccine is down here, then we say, go get the vaccine. 100%. And, and that's, that's true even now. Um, and, and actually for all age groups. Yeah. So, um, uh, and we've been saying that all along. How, you know, have you seen myocarditis from the vaccine personally? Personally, we have. Um, fort we're fortunate here that one between the treatments that we have and, and kind of the teams that we have to support us is um, we've seen mostly mild cases. Um, the one rare case of, of more moderate um, did require hospitalization, but it was still a self-resolved course with, with good recovery. Yeah. Um, I, would, I would say that outside of that, most of these cases are if they are even presenting and making it to the hospital system are still going home almost the same day to the next day. Yeah, so they don't even spend a night in the hospital. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so that's good news too. Um, the, um, I, so, you know, for high school athletics, back to the sports thing yeah. though again, um, are there recommendations for high school and college athletics and how, what to do after COVID? Um, yeah, um, there's this American College of Cardiology. They kind of set a lot of guidelines that we end up using that have, have looked at this um, intensely over the, especially the last few months. Um, and a lot of times um, they, they set out kind of formal recommendations of saying, if you have concerns that you have myocarditis or heart involvement, you need to be evaluated. And then they give us as cardiologists guidelines of saying these are the types of tests in terms of blood or imaging. If there is heart involvement, here's generally the time frame we're looking at before you give a full you know, reevaluation and return to play. Three to six months yeah. is kind of about what they're saying versus you know, even if your suspicion is high for myocarditis, but they're not showing you any evidence, their blood is normal, their, their imaging is normal, then don't, don't add any limitations, uh -huh. support them and let them kind of continue with their athletic life. I see. So most of the time it doesn't affect that, their that's future. The, exactly, athletics. that's the majority yeah. of it there. So let's say you're a high school track runner and, um, and you got COVID and you had your three or four days of a bit of a cough, a little bit of a sore throat and then it went away and, and you feel perfect now. And do you need to be evaluated? If you're feeling back to your normal self, I would say no. Continue on course, keep running. Yeah, there Win you go. Win some medals. Win some medals. <laughs> yeah, that's good advice. So, um, is there anything we haven't talked about that you think it's important for people to know? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, I think the biggest point <clears throat> is if, if you are concerned that your heart is involved, um, if you have, you know, other, you see a doctor regularly for other conditions. Um, just understanding that always get your heart looked at and checked out if you think it is your heart. Um, and if you have other diseases that you um, are currently managing, um, but not necessarily your heart, understanding that this, this infection and any kind of real infection um, can take a toll on the heart. So it's very important to stay yeah. on top of that um, from that. That's end. good advice. And again, that's chest pain, particularly chest pain that doesn't go away. Exactly. It radiates up to the jaw, maybe down the arm. Oftentimes you get short of breath with yep. it, might feel some fluttering. Um, and certainly if you have risk factors for heart disease, Absolutely. smoking, obesity, diabetes, family history, that's strong. Absolutely. So that's the group. Well, I really appreciate you coming by uh, and getting a chance to chat with me about this. It's all great advice. Um, so. We're going to take a. We're going to take three weeks until our next update. Um, there's a, this little thing called spring break for the public schools, and um, and so the 21st of April we'll be back, and we're going to talk about uh, pregnancy and COVID on the, at that time, and we'll also give an update and let you know whether BA2, um, how much of it's around. By the way, right now, 
little around 35 to 40 percent of a herring triad is a BA2. And I don't see a lot of COVID falling from the sky yet. Raindrops, but no COVID. So in three weeks, we'll talk about pregnancy and COVID because there's some really important things about that, um, uh, both about vaccination and, um, and the infection itself and pregnancy. So we'll have uh, one of my colleagues in uh, obstetrics and gynecology, and we'll have a good chat about that. If uh, for three weeks down the road, you want to send in some of your questions uh, that you want us to address, uh, please do so uh, through our Facebook page. Um, or uh, Wake Forest Baptist Health uh, webpage, and um, and uh, we'll address them then. So see you in three weeks.